We're going to continue in the Gospel of Mark in our, in our series. It's the Gospel of Mark. You know, one of the great things about, from a, at least from a preacher's perspective, of doing a book instead of selecting a topic is you can you don't have to uh, make a uh, give a reason why you're preaching the hard stuff. <laughs> Uh, so when you get to the hard stuff, you didn't say, "Well, I didn't, I didn't choose the sermon today. We just, it's just, it's just the next uh, passage in the series." But we don't have the hard stuff today. We have some really good stuff, and the title of today's sermon is "Help Wanted." So let's take a look at Mark, chapter three, verse seven. Listen for the word of the Lord. Jesus withdrew with his disciples to the sea, and a great crowd followed from Galilee and Judea and Jerusalem and Idumea and from beyond the Jordan, and from around Tyre and Sidon. When the great crowd heard all that he was doing, they came to him, and he told his disciples to have a boat ready for him because of the crowd, lest they crush him. For he had healed many, so that all who had diseases pressed around him to touch him. And whenever the unclean spirits saw him, they fell down before him and cried out, You are the Son of God. And he strictly ordered them not to make him known. And he went up on the mountain and called to him those whom he desired. And they came to him, and he appointed twelve, whom he also named apostles, so that they might be with him, and he might send them out to preach and have authority to cast out demons. He appointed the twelve. Simon, to whom he gave the name Peter, James the son of Zebedee, and John the brother of James, to whom he gave the name Boendres, and that is the sons of thunder, Andrew and Philip and Bartholomew and Matthew and Thomas and James the son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus and Simon the zealot and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. I'm sure as I was reading through these verses, you notice that they, they really divide into two parts or two episodes. Verses 7 through 12, which deal or discuss with Jesus and how the crowds came to him and pressed in upon him. And then verses 13 through 19, which take Jesus up onto the mountain and his calling of the disciples to him there and his appointing of the, uh, of the 12. But let's take these passages in order. Notice in the first passage, Jesus withdrew and the crowds followed him. And they came from Galilee and Judea, and Jerusalem, and Idumea, and from beyond the Jordan, and from Tyre and Sidon. Now, if you're, if you're a reader of the Bible at all, you're going to recognize Galilee. That's where Capernaum is. And you're going to recognize Judea because Jerusalem is centered as the capital of Judea. But Idumea? Idumea is not one of those names that readily comes to mind when you think about the Bible. Idumea was an area south of Jerusalem, really south of the Dead Sea. It was beyond Israel proper, and it was a place of mixed population. There were idol worshipers, and it was a long way from Capernaum. It would have been several days' walk to get up north to Capernaum. And then we have beyond the Jordan. That would have been the area from everywhere, everywhere east of the Jordan, and there would be, that would also be a mixed place where you'd find, you would find some Jews there, but you would find some Gentiles. And then Tyre and Sidon. Tyre and Sidon would have been north and east of, uh, of Capernaum in an area today that's known as Lebanon. And that's all, they were all Gentiles that came from there. So in coming from Galilee, that would be around, immediately around where Jesus was. From Judea, that's two, two or three days walk. Idumea, five or six days walk probably. People were coming from everywhere. And, there, and Jews and Gentiles were coming, not just not just, uh, uh, not just Jews, but Jews and Gentiles were coming. They were, so people, long story short, they were coming from everywhere. And why were they coming? They were coming to be healed. You may remember already in Mark, we've seen Jesus heal this, uh, this leper. And Jesus told him not to tell anybody, but, but to go and present himself to the priest to follow the law of Moses. Because the law, under the law of Moses, if a leper was healed, he had to be declared clean, ceremonially clean, by the priest so he could go to the temple or so he could offer worship. He just, but what did he do? He told everybody he saw what, what had happened and who had done it, and he said Jesus couldn't even go into the villages because the crowds were just flocked around him, so he went to desolate places. So the word has gotten out 
five or six days journey. Imagine how far in a car you can drive in six days. You could be to the North Pole practically by then. So this is a big area of people that have come, and they've come and they're pressing in on Jesus. Pressing in so, they, if you read the Gospels, you see so many people thought if they could just touch him. Remember the woman with a discharge? I mean, she thought if she, she, if she touched his gown and, she, and he was, she would be healed. So if they thought if they could just touch the man, they would be healed. And they, were, they literally were pressing in on him, and he was at the sea, and he told his disciples to get a boat ready. So Jesus had a practical side, too. He said, I may, need to, I may to get, need to get wet and get in this boat and get out of here. And although, you know, the, the people wanted to be healed. And although Mark does not tell us directly, we can be sure that Jesus did heal these people. How do we know that? Well, Mark does tell us that Jesus healed those who were possessed by demons, that he cast out the demons. And But we also know, because we've read the gospel, and we've, read, we've already seen in Mark, and, we, and because we know who Jesus was, and we know who Jesus is, that he healed everyone who came to him. So if people were coming to him to be healed, he was healing them. He was healing them not just spiritually, not just driving out the demon that possessed them, but he was healing these people physically. And what else would we know that Jesus would have been doing as this crowd pressed in around him, we know that he would have been preaching the gospel. He would have been t telling them the good news. He would have been sharing the good news with them. He would have been proclaiming to them the kingdom of God, the kingdom of a God who not only makes promises, but he keeps his promises. Because what is Mark? What has Jesus already declared in the gospel? The, the, uh, he's been healing these people. He's been preaching the good news to them, and they go to sleep. And Jesus wakes up early in the morning, and he goes out to a desolate, desolate place. And the disciples are all looking for him. And Peter says, he basically says, Jesus, you got a great thing going on here. You've got this healing stuff going on. People are coming from everywhere. They want to see you. And Jesus said, I must go to other villages and towns and proclaim. The good news, for that is why I came. So Jesus isn't going to encounter a crowd of people and just be engaged in healing. As I've said before, if Jesus had healed every man, woman, and child who needed healing and had raised every person who was dead from the grave and then had gone back to heaven, where would, where would all those people be and where would we still be today? We would be in our sins and we would be dead in our sins. So, and we can safely say that even as the crowd pressed in around Jesus and, and the weight of the crowd threatened to crush him, he would have continued to do what he had been doing all along. Not just healing, but he would have been preaching the good news. He would have been continuing his ministry. If you think about Jesus' ministry and you want to sum up his ministry in two words, short, I'm talking about short of the cross, but the cross in a way is, is actually the second part of this. It actually breaks down into two components, declaring and demonstrating, or declaration and demonstration. Declaration of what? Declaration of the kingdom, that who, who God is, what God has promised, what God is like, what the kingdom is like. So there's the declaration of the kingdom, but then the second component of, of Jesus' ministry is the declaration of the kingdom. And he never did one without the other. If he healed, he also preached. And if he preached, he also healed. The two went hand in hand. And I'm sure even as this crowd pressed in around him, he would have continued the demonstration, uh, not the declaration of the kingdom, even as he demonstrated the kingdom. Have you ever seen that, uh, talking about healing and about just doing what you got to do, I'm sure, I'm sure all of you here, almost everyone probably seen the commercial where the little, kid's, the little kid's in his room or her room and mom comes in and she's got the sniffles or whatever and she said, sorry, but I'm going to have to take a sick day. And then the, the announcer says, moms don't take sick days. Well, Jesus didn't take sick days. Jesus didn't stop being who he was at any point along the way from Bethlehem where he was born to Calvary where he was crucified. He was always the same, always the same. 
And so Jesus couldn't help but respond. If someone was in need, Jesus' heart went out to them. He responded to them. He didn't take a day off. And the people were broken, these people who were pressing in around him. They were broken. They were living in sin. And they were living with the consequences of sin. Their own sin, because who doesn't sin? And the consequences of the original sinners, Adam and Eve, because we live in a fallen world. And they would have been groaning under the weight of this fallenness. And then they would have encountered Jesus, who came to do what? Jesus came that they might have life and have it more abundantly. He came that we might have life and have it more abundantly. Do you ever think about that? Think about that, you know. You're saved. You're saved to be alive. You're free from this. You know, there are three components of being saved. We're saved from sin's penalty, which is death. As we live, we are, being, we are being saved from sin's power, which is to cause us to sin again. And then when we are with Christ, we are saved in heaven. We are saved from the very presence of sin. And that's a wonderful thing to think about. But we don't, we Christians really, by and large, don't live, don't live out the power that's been given to us. Jesus said, I came that I might have life and have it abundantly, not just in the there and then, but in the here and now. I fear too many Christians are going to get to heaven and they're going to realize, they're going to see what, what it all is and they're going to say, God, how, Lord, help me. I've been living in the basement. I didn't realize. I had a big screen TV and I had everything. The refrigerator was full and there was all this stuff. I didn't realize you were giving me this life. It isn't about stuff. It's about him. But we know we're saved, but we don't. And Jesus wanted to do that and he just couldn't help but give them a taste of what the kingdom would be like. But here's the deal. This need that it, these crowds had expressed to him, this tremendous need of, their, of, of them and their sin, and the consequences of their sin, and the suffering that they, that they lived out day to day and moment to moment, Jesus knew. He knew he was going to the cross. He knew he'd make a way for them to be saved from sin's, the penalty of sin and from sin's power and all the rest of it. But he also knew he would not always be with them in the flesh. He wasn't going to be with them there day in and day out. That there would come a time when he would go back to be with the Father. As we read in Matthew chapter 9, And Jesus went throughout all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Laborers into his harvest. Pray to the Father. Pray to the Lord to send out laborers into this harvest to, to meet this, who, people who would meet this tremendous need. I'm not saying that Jesus needed, did Jesus, that God the Son needed anything. But I am going to say and I can say with authority and safety that Jesus wanted help. He didn't need help, but he wanted help. He invited, he was prepared to invite others into this ministry of his. The ministry, he wanted others to join in the work, the work for which he came and died and lived again to accomplish. He didn't need our help. He didn't need man's help, but he wanted help. Yes, the, the harvest was plentiful. I mean, yes, the, the, the crowds were plentiful and the need was felt. And they were pressing in upon him with their fallenness. But the workers to minister to that fall, the fallenness, they were few. They were few. And the crowds who pressed in upon him, they spoke to that need so, so powerfully. Which brings us to the title of today's sermon, Help Wanted. Help Wanted. That's a... I think when I came up with that title, I think I was, I was uh, speaking of my age a little bit. Help Wanted is not a term so familiar with us anymore. If you would allow me to engage my imagination for a little bit and imagine that, that Jesus had, um, had the modern means of communication at his uh, fingertips, uh, he might have chosen a newspaper. I, do, how many of you still subscribe to the Commercial Appeal? 
Uh, that's about right. That's about right. I used to subscribe. Ellie and I used to subscribe. We don't anymore. But I picked up a paper this week, and I said, let me see if one ads are still in the paper. So I went to the to the local local section, and on the back it had it was had the classifies. Was, you know, it used to, used to be in the classifies you'd find help wanted, houses for sale, it'd be all that stuff. Now we've got legal notices that are about foreclosures. But as I was going through there, I came to the obituaries. And that reminded me of a neighbor of mine. He, he got the paper. He read it every day. And he said, I said, well, Doug, what, what parts are you? He said, well, I always start with the obituaries. And I said, why are you starting with the obituaries? He said, I just want to make sure I'm not on the list yet. <laughs> but if Jesus said, you know, you know, you can still take out an ad. So maybe Jesus would have taken out, you know, if he had taken a conventional approach and he had had this access to modern means, he would have. Of course, if you were to the, here today, he wouldn't, he wouldn't go to the newspaper, but he'd go to monster.com. Can you imagine a job place called monster.com? Are they, are they anticipating what kind of boss you're going to have? I, mean, I don't know what that's all about. But He could have had a help wanted. He could have, this would have, what if Jesus had, taken, had actually been able to post a help wanted ad? Help wanted. No experience necessary. Will train. Looking for a, looking, listen, this might have been Jesus' help wanted ad. Looking for a few humble men to do the following. Cast out demons. Heal the sick. Raise the dead. And preach good news to the poor. So far, so good, right? Successful applicants must be ready and willing to be put out of synagogues or churches. And must even be willing to die for the one they serve. Now things are getting rough, right? Fringe benefits include sleeping outside, walking long distances in all kinds of weather, and living hand to mouth. Um, I might look a little bit farther in the paper if I'm going to be. That's the, that's the job description. But Jesus, you know, Jesus didn't, didn't take the conventional approach. He didn't send out word to, to uh, bring people to him and let him. Bring, okay, if you, I'm thinking about I'm going I'm to get 12 disciples. Would you let people know I'm looking for 12 disciples and have them bring their resume? And I'll take a look. And we'll have interviews. And if, we, if I like them, we'll have second interviews. And then I'll let them meet other people that I'm close to, and maybe we'll, and when we'll make a decision. But that, Jesus didn't take the conventional approach. Let's, let's look at what he did. Looking again back at the verses we read earlier, he went up on the mountain and called to him those whom he desired, and he appointed twelve whom he also named apostles, so that they might be with him, and he might send them out to preach and have authority to cast out demons. He appointed the twelve. He appointed the twelve. Look at some of these key words, some of these key words or phrases here. Up on the mountain. How often in the Bible is up on the mountain a key location of important events? Moses spent 40 days on the mountain with God and he brought down the Ten Commandments. Abraham took, my, uh, took Isaac to Mount Moriah and acted out there, on the verge of acting out there, a potential sacrifice that would that would foreshadow the ultimate sacrifice, the ultimate offering of a son. Jesus would often go, remember the sermon, Jesus' greatest sermon. What is it? The sermon on the mount. The sermon on the mount. But so being up on the mountain speaks to being set apart. Being, Jesus will tell, he'll tell his disciples later on, you must be in the world, but not of the world. There is a certain there is a sense in which Christians must be set apart. The mountain speaks to that. And then Jesus says he called them to him. Jesus will later tell his disciples, you did not choose me, but I chose you. So this call, Jesus is calling them. And when Jesus calls you, you have no choice, but you come. It says they came, basically. They came. What else could they do? What else could they do? And then he appointed them. That is, he, he commissioned them. He named them. He, this is a further process of setting them apart for a special job, a special mission. And he set them apart so that they might be with him. Jesus will later tell his disciples, apart from me, you can do nothing. So it's in being with Jesus. It's being with Jesus. They were going to be with him for about three more years, day in and day out, night and day, on the road. What did Jesus tell the young man? He said, he came out, he came out and he said, Lord, he said, Master, he says, I'll follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said, are you kidding me? I don't even have a place to sleep. 
I don't have a place. I don't have a, I, how many nights did Jesus and the disciples sleep out in, in the open sky at the open sky motel, right? Yeah. There was a lot of that stuff. So, but they had to be with him. They were with him, with him day in and day out. Now, we don't have Jesus with us in the flesh anymore. Jesus said, my sheep know my voice. Where would we go today to find Jesus' voice? I hope you're hearing it now. Not that I have anything to offer, but God has called me to come and talk to you, to speak, to speak to you. But where is beyond that? Where, do we, where can we go every day to hear Jesus' voice? To his word. It's written. It's in the Bible. He speaks to us through his word. And so we, Jesus is still with us. And of course, he's with us even more powerfully than that because the spirit, his spirit lives within those who have put their faith in him. We are, if once you become a Christian, you are never, it's not ever, ever possible for you to be alone again. Jesus is with you. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit lives within you. So when you're doing things you shouldn't be doing, he's looking at you. That's another thing to think about. But he called them to him and he appointed them so that they might do what? So that they might just stay with him? Do we become Christians so that we can just read our Bible and come to church? Don't, you don't have to raise your hand. I see too many guilty folks out there. Read the Bible, go to church. Read the Bible, go to church. Check the box, check the box. Check the box, check the box. Did Jesus say, just, uh, I'm just going to stay with you and you're going to stay with me and then um, that's it? No. He wanted them to go out. He was going to send them out. He was, you know what apostle means? Apostle means one who has been sent. Who has been sent? They, they, so they, they, they charge their Jesus batteries and then they go out to share the love that Jesus has shown them. Now, that, the ultimate sending out will, of course, not happen until after Pentecost. But you have to get there. So, one of the main points of that is, is that it's not about... I said Jesus didn't go the conventional route. He didn't interview these people. He didn't get their resumes. He didn't find out the best folks. Now, I will say, if he had taken the, first, if he had taken the conventional approach when he came to Judas... Uh, if he said, uh, his, here's, the, here's the recommendation. Judas knows how to deal with money. He's very much a worldly person who looks after himself. We're, we think he's going to do well going up the ladder. But, that, but that, here's the main thing. is that these, it didn't, did, Jesus didn't need to know about these folks. So far, what have, we, what have we encountered? Four fishermen and a tax collector. Not exactly the people you would choose if you want to build a kingdom on this earth, Right? It, didn't, it wasn't about them. It was always about him. It was always about Christ. So, that's the second thing. Now, let's look at these 12 that he chose. Simon, also known as Peter. James, the son of Zebedee. John, the brother of James. And then Andrew and Philip. Bartholomew, Matthew, Thomas. James, the son of Alphaeus. Thaddeus. Simon the Zealot. Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. Let's leave Judas Iscariot aside because what we're really dealing with here today really has to do with the 11. How many of you know what Thaddeus is famous for other than being named a disciple? Name me one great thing you know Thaddeus did. You're not going to come up with an answer. Uh, what about John, the, James, the son of Alphaeus? Some great thing James did. Some great church that he founded or community that he ministered to. Can you name? Most of these people, we know quite a bit about Peter, but for the majority, for the rest of them, the Jameses that are mentioned here is not the James that wrote the, the letter in the Bible. John, the, the John that's mentioned here, is actually an, was an apostle. He wrote the Gospel of John. He wrote three letters. He also wrote, wrote Revelation. But for the most part, these people are anonymous. We don't even know what happened. The tradition tells us that Thomas made it all the way to India where he died in, in a missionary venture. Paul, the greatest known apostle, we know more about him than any of the rest, but he's not, even, he's not on this list. These people are anonymous. They served, and we have no doubt that they served out the rest of their lives serving Christ with, every, with their heart, soul, and mind. But the, but the attention was not drawn to them. They weren't drawing attention to themselves. They weren't saying, look at me, look at me, look, what, look at what I've done. And in that regard, 
They were laboring in the vineyard in anonymity, but in that regard, they were following their master. Look at the teachings of their master. Let's take a look at what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 6. Teaching his disciples now. He says, Beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them. For then you will have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. Thus when you give to the needy, sound no trumpet before you, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may be praised by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. You would think, sometimes I think Jesus is talking about our government, but that's just me. <laughs> so that your giving may be in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues, read churches, and at the street corners, that they might be seen by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their rewards. But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. Pray then like this, and He gives them the Lord's Prayer, which we pray every week. And then he finishes with this. And when you fast, do not look gloomy like the hypocrites, for they disfigure their faces that their fasting may be seen by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face, that your fasting may not be seen by others, but by your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. Jesus taught his disciples over and over again. What did he say about himself? I did not come to be served, but to serve. Whoever would be first must be last. It's not about us. He was telling his disciples, he taught them every day, it's not about you, it's about God. It's about God the Father. It's about me. It's about serving God, the Father, God, the Son, and eventually, as they will know after Pentecost, God, the Holy Spirit, who all of whom are one. It's not about, it's not about us. And his disciples apparently got that lesson very, very well, except for, as I say, Judas. Judas had a different mission. That's another sermon. But the 11 got it very well. Even Peter, who always wanted to rush to the first of the class. I can walk on water, I can walk on water, I can walk on water, uh, until I can't. Uh, help me, Lord. Help me, Lord. But in the end, they all got the message of help me, Lord, because without Jesus' help, we can do nothing. But here's the thing. Go from this place, knowing that it's all about Him, knowing that Jesus does not need our help, but He wants our help. Knowing that, you know, if you look at the history of the Bible, look at the Bible, the story of the Bible all the way through, since the fall, God has invited us into fellowship with Him so that we may be renewed in that, and this, but ultimately so that He may be glorified through us. And by everything that we do, He's working in us. And, and that is a great, great blessing that He called us to be in fellowship with Him to do His work in this place. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank You that You have invited us we know, Lord, you don't need our help, but we pray, Lord, and thank you, Lord, that you invite us into fellowship with you to do your work, to go out into the vineyard, to go out into this world where people who don't know you or people that they have heard of you, but they've rejected you, to be your hands and feet here and far, even farther afield so that people in encountering us would hear your word of love and welcome and hope the hope that does not pass away, the hope that does not depend on circumstance, but that depends on your promise. Because Lord, once you have promised it, it's, it, it is a truth, and it will never be other than true. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.